Have you ever wondered what drives the passionate entrepreneurs and interesting people in the hunting, fishing, and outdoor industry? Well, I did, so I set out to meet them. Aldo Leopold said, There are those who can live without wild things and those who cannot. These are the exclusive interviews with those who cannot. My name is Casey Mock. In 2008, I turned my passion for wildlife into a career when I launched our hunting firm, Fever Pursuit. Our family of companies has grown and now includes wildlife management and ranch real estate sales. I get to work with some of the best people and top ranches in the country, and I want to share their stories of adventure, failures, and the business principles that have led to their success. This is the Bucks to Business podcast presented by Mock Ranches. Admit it. All of us have had that Homer Simpson moment where you see a product on the shelf and you say, Dope! Why didn't I think of that? Well, our guest for Episode 5 is Billy Gerke, and he did think of that. His company, Foreverlast Hunting and Fishing Products, produces practical and functional gear for hunters and fishermen. Billy's an accomplished American entrepreneur, and we can all learn from the grit and determination it took to get his company off the ground. Billy's a leader in the outdoor industry, his community, and he's actively involved in his church in Hallettsville, Texas. He's a fighting Texas Aggie, and he's been asked to give business presentations to the business classes at Texas A&M University. Let's travel to Hallettsville, Texas, and join Billy for episode number five of the Bucks to Business podcast, starting right now. Billy, I'm really excited to have you uh, as a guest on Bucks to Business podcast. Um, We've known each other for a few years have some really good mutual friends. I think the world of you. Um, I'm really inspired by entrepreneurs and the grit and the grind it takes uh, to establish a successful business. And you've done that. I respect the heck out of you for it. So thanks for spending a few minutes with us today. Heck yeah. Glad to be here, man. Um, you you nailed it. It's a, it's a grind. Every day is a grind and none of it comes easy. Um, I think for us, keeping God at the center of it has been very important. And leaning on him when times get tough, or even when times are the, at the at the top of the game, uh, you've got to give him glory and, yeah. and honor that. And that's instilled in all of our employees here. Uh, it's been kind of our grassroots approach from the beginning. Um, you know, starting a business and and taking it to the level that it's at now. Uh, I never would have dreamed that when I was attending A and M or. Or back in high school. You're fighting Texas season. Aggie. I'm a fighting Texas Aggie. Season ticket holder. <laughs> Not quite. No, Not y'all are quite. having a rough season here well, in the I've second gotta, half. I've got to work, man. I can't go to all those <laughs> games. So. And i got a couple boys growing up, so we don't have a lot of time for that. But, yeah. no, I bleed maroon um, and uh, and enjoy that. But, you know, I never dreamed that I would be sitting um, where we are today with a, a brand that's got uh, some substance in the marketplace. Uh Fishing and hunting both, uh, something that I'm very passionate about and, yeah. and I've learned more about through this business and, and learned a lot from the people that are that we work with as guides and, and outfitters and things like that. And you have to eat, sleep, and breathe it to, you really do. to innovate the way you've innovated and, and stay in a business this long and keep your passion. And I ident- think. identifying the product need and, and, and fitting that to the consumer's budget and making that all work, you know, putting a quality product out there but also keeping it affordable. Yeah. So that the average guy can go out and enjoy the sport and use the products and and get a quality product, f- you know, for their money. Uh, we just came off the heels of a pretty um, major election last week. Yes, sir. And you know, doesn't matter really which side people were on on that deal. I think, you know, what is at stake is our American liberty to come out and do what you and I do, and that's wake up every day, pray with our families have the freedom to go out into the workplace and build businesses, employ people, create jobs, and have the freedom to go hunt and fish. You know, if, I was thinking about this, a little off topic, but I have a tendency to do that. It's my <laughs> podcast, I can do that. Um, I was thinking the other day, somebody was talking about you know, liberties and why our founding fathers established the Constitution the way they did and why people even came to the United States. You know what one of the major reasons was? It was the it was opportunity. The, it, well, it, was, it was a right to hunt and fish. It was a bunch of it. Yeah. People say religious freedom, and that's a big part of it. But if you look at the North American model for wildlife management, which is which is access, hunter and fisher access, and the right for the public to own and manage a resource, contrast that with the European model, which was in place there and it is now. Mm-hmm. It's the wealthy only. It's government-controlled. And so for you and I, that should hit home um, 
and you know we have freedoms in this country to to do what you and I do. It's it's pretty special. So, introduce yourself real quick and your family. Give us a short rundown. You got a you got a beautiful wife and and two pretty talented boys that like the outdoors. Yeah, I've got a. Uh, I spoke to a class at A and M here a while back, and I told them to pick your partners wisely. And I wasn't talking about the business partner. I was yeah. talking about my life, your life partner, the one you sleep in bed with every night, because. Without their support, you cannot do anything cannot successfully. Because uh, if they're dragging you down, and and I've I've been blessed. My wife is uh, is my number one fan, and and I am hers, and so it's worked really good. And we got two beautiful sons. Ty is fourteen now in eighth grade, and Lane is ten, and he's in the in the fifth grade, and they are uh, <laughs> they're handfuls, and and uh, but they share our passion for the outdoors. They've grown up around it, of course. And, yeah seeing what we've done here with our business and i think they're setting up to uh to come fill in my shoes at one point at some point but um you know uh just been blessed and and you know don't take any of it for granted because it, you know as we all know things can change and but we are you know we keep a positive outlook you know we've been blessed to hire a couple employees that are key to our operations bradley has been with me since uh, 09 and he uh, he runs everything from uh, unloading trucks to loading them back up and mm-hmm. and everything in between. And uh, Man, our team, it's that's one thing that I've seen in, in small business. People that can master hiring and take really good care of their employees. There's a couple mm-hmm. ways to pre- to approach that. People that master hiring, they hire the right people and then take the best care of them. If you if you can give Bradley every opportunity to grow and achieve his goals inside your organization, he'll stay forever. Correct. It'll be loyalty and treat it like it's his own, you know. And he does. He takes he takes it very serious and takes ownership in it. And then Kelly came on with us uh, probably about three years ago, and she's been key to our um, office, you know, managing the office mm-hmm. and keeping things straight in, inside and keeping Bradley on his toes and yeah. making sure all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. But you know, it takes a team to make all this work. Yes, and, it does. And in, and in order to grow, it takes people. And and you know that you you hit it earlier that. The land of the opportunity and, and creating a business such as this is the American dream, and and it does. You know, I'm proud to say we have employees and we're, and we're providing for them, and and they're providing for themselves through yeah. the business. And uh, you know, we've we've had some crippling years over the past couple of years, so this election was key mm-hmm. to uh, small business and and to the success of our our nation and our our country and. These small businesses are the ones that create the jobs and to keep uh, growth and opportunity yeah. happening. And so if there's not people like yourself trying new things and venturing off and doing new things, then how in the heck are we going to grow? Yeah. And when when your government's holding you back, um, that's a problem. So I'm I'm really uh, I'm really yeah. glad for the change. We needed a change. Every business we start, and you and I have started multiple independently, mm-hmm. um, every one we start requires people. And we can't go take that risk and invest the money and hire the people or even have the dream to do it yeah. if we don't see a reward. And that's not a possibility. And it is in this country. We're proud of that. So if you're listening to this podcast, I'm going to go out on a limb and assume you like to hunt. I bet you like to hunt for free even more. Go to feverpursuit.com slash podcast and subscribe for a chance to win a free hunt. That's feverpursuit.com slash podcast. So I was researching uh, your website yesterday to get a little content. And, and I know I'm very familiar with your company, what you do. I use your products religiously. Um, but I wanted to get down to what drives Billy, the core uh, behind the business, what the culture is here, and then get into some, uh, some challenges, things you've had to overcome as a company, what you're learning, where you see the industry going. But so, you know, when I, when I go research companies, I always start on the About Us page. And if I can find actually something from the founder, I want to get to that because I'm a firm believer in Gary Keller wrote a book uh, called The One Thing. It's talking about what's, what's the most important to you, what's the most important activity you do. But in there, he talks about what your big why is, your big drive, you know, what, what's the heartbeat behind the organization. And so I, I read yours and it says, we live hunting and fishing. With the way of the world these days, we can only hold to these very few consistencies that we're guaranteed in our lives. Those being God, family, friends, and the great outdoors. The heartbeat, spirit, and tradition of the outdoors are what our company and all of our products are founded upon. You wrote that? I did. 
Kelly didn't write that? No. <laughs> no, that, that came from the heart, and uh, I mean every word of it, you know. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I'm not going to lie to you. Um, being at the top of an organization comes with pressure. Yes, it does. And um, you've got a target on you. Some people just inevitably want you to fail. Mm-hmm. And you have to keep proving to them that you're not going to let that happen. Mm-hmm. So there are challenges. There are sleepless nights that come with these businesses. I'm not going to lie to you at all. I mean, there's there's times when I want to crawl off in a hole and not deal with it <laughs> today. But I know that I have to get up each day and go to work and um, and make things happen because I've got my family's counting on it and my employees are counting on it. And, hell, at the end of the day, my customers are counting on it. You bet they are. And so... Um, those are those are very big things to us, and um, you know I, I go back to this a lot when I'm visiting with people. But without my faith, I don't I don't know how I would get through some of this stuff, you know. And and keeping uh, staying grounded, staying humble, um, trying to uh, always do right before profits. Yeah, you know, make things right before you worry about your profits. And so, you know, we always try to take care of the customers and, and do what we can to help everybody out. So what was your goal for starting for Everlast? You said 17 years ago when y'all started? You know, I realized quickly out of college I wasn't going to get rich working for somebody else. Yeah. And, um, I, you know, I'd always kind of dreamed of having my name on a cap or on a shirt. Yeah. Something cool, you know. And uh, I don't know. It just kind of came to me that there's a need for products in the outdoors that aren't there. And, uh my father-in-law inspired me on our first product. He had he had, he was a machinist for forty-seven years, and had actually built a tool that we used while we were hunting. And I said, "Man, you know, I think people would really like that." And uh, so I took that into academy and and got that going, and then that led to the next product and the next product and the next product and on and on. And now we have over sixty items that we manage, and uh, you know that's. That's the challenge of it now is, is becoming the, the good manager of the products and the inventory and keeping those rolling. I think you hit it on the head. Successful businesses, successful entrepreneurs, they solve a problem in the marketplace for consumers. Yeah, I think too often people get caught up in innovation. They want to create the next million-dollar idea. Well, you might make a million dollars one waiting boot at a time. <laughs> you know, How do you innovate and improve on – or excuse me, not innovate. How do you improve on – the waiting boot. Let's let's just use a, a, right. a close example to home here. How do you improve in the waiting boot such that you solve a problem for wade fishermen? Same thing could be for feeders or whatever. How do, what is the problem in the market? How do you go solve that problem and then go sell those and then improve on it and improve on it and continue benchmarking and trending organization? And um, one day you end up with the million dollar idea, and uh, but you didn't get there overnight. And um, yeah, I think you nailed it. So how's the company evolved in, in 17 years? How has Foreverlast Incorporated involved? Well, it was definitely a moonlight evil. business for about uh, the first seven, eight years. You know, I was working a full-time job. What'd you do? I, I was selling agricultural chemicals for distributor. And okay. I called on businesses much like I do now and sold them products for their business to, uh, they put out, you know, uh, weed spray mm-hmm. and stuff like that on pastures. Mm-hmm. Range of pasture was my focus and uh here in Hallettsville area yeah, I lived in Hallettsville where I live now and and so it it, it afforded me time to moonlight and do some things yeah. that, on the side that I needed to get done in order to make this business start rolling and how long did you go through that moonlight process 2007 I finally decided um that I was gonna you know break away and, and keep in mind I had company truck company phone yeah. gas card I've been there insurance uh my wife wasn't working she stayed home with Ty so, you know, and the, and the boys, once we had them, and, and uh, she's a registered nurse, but, uh, she, you know, we were able, because I was doing mm-hmm. this and doing the other job, we, you know, we lived pretty sparsely, but we made it work. Yeah. And uh, and so, fortunately, when I made the break in 2007. That was after seven years of moonlight. Seven years of, of doing both. Yeah, working my butt off, loading trucks, unloading trucks. I think it's so important for people to hear that because... Owning and starting a small business, man, it is a grind. Mm-hmm. It's a grind. And it it could take easily seven to ten years yeah. to get independent in some industries. Some people can do it in six months. You know, right. it's, it's not all that time. But a lot of people get in, into a business and they start a business. I don't think they're expecting that. Oh, it, it takes a lot of work and late hours. And, uh, you know, I can remember Casey 
loading the back of my truck up early in the morning and running the product to Academy because I didn't want to pay a freight company to do yeah. it. So I'd leave Hallettsville at 5.30, get on the road. I'd be there waiting in line with all the 18-wheelers and me and my little pickup truck. <laughs> and I'd line up behind them, and I'd go to the dock, and them guys would kind of look at me funny. Yeah. But uh, they'd pat me on the back and sign my ticket, and I was gone. And yeah. I'd be back in Hallettsville by 7.30 and start my job. You know, And I remember those days very vividly because – you know, everything from unloading the truck to loading them back up and labeling product and, and doing all that, it, it, it is a grind. And it and it took that to get to where we are today. You know, there wasn't room for overhead for those first seven years. You know, I was feeding my family, so I had to do it all. Yeah. And uh, not until '09 did we hire our first employee. So it took me two years even after I went yeah. full-time to get enough business in order to you know start hiring people and building yeah you a facility. went nine years from really owning a job mm-hmm. right having having it right. as a second part-time job right two years of just owning your own job and then on year nine it finally started taking shape and forming actually a company where you got to yep. leverage your talents and leverage the, the company's assets and resources and start building the staff and i promise i promised my first employee bradley i said look can't afford to pay you much right now, but if you stay with me, brother, you're gonna you'll be rewarded. Yeah. And I think you could ask him right now, and he's been rewarded. Yeah. I didn't let him down on that promise. And, That's awesome. But he's helped us get to where we are today, and without that, you know, uh, you've got to you've got to let them help you get to where you want to be. Yeah. You know, and so it's a, but man, there is always challenges along the way, and and I would I would encourage any any other entrepreneur out there. Don't let anybody tell me you can't do it because people told me it'll never work. It it will never last instead of forever last. <laughs> well, and and we've outlasted that deal. So, so what are some of the things you've had to overcome in seventeen years? Well, biggest you know, challenge. I mean, there's a bunch. The right? shock, the shock of overhead expenses. I guess would be yeah. one of the main things, and you know whether that be product liability insurance or um, you know just the ins and outs of the business, the overhead expenses that you don't really plan for, but that just pop up on you. Uh, those are some of the things that you go, wow, you know, we've got to, we've got to sell a lot of product just to cover overhead. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so, so, so some of that's been eye opening to me. Uh, I wasn't very good at accounting when I was in college and, but I could probably teach a class now, uh, yeah. because I've had to, I've had to teach you myself. You have to know the numbers. You have to know. You cannot depend on your staff. As a small business owner, you cannot depend on your staff to know the numbers. No. Now, that doesn't mean they can't crunch them and bring them to you weekly in a financial report. But okay. I think too many entrepreneurs kick that ball down the down the, mm-hmm. down the the sidewalk and say, that's somebody else's job. That's a huge mistake. It's the, it's, it's that's the, irresponsible. It's the president's job yeah. to review the numbers because if you're not paying attention to those, and those are indicators of where you're headed. If you're not doing well now, probably in three months, you're probably not going to be doing much better if That's you don't right. change something. So, you know, I review those and I go over them with my employees so that they understand what's going on. Yeah. <clears throat> if we're struggling, then I show them. And what, say, about, what about getting distribution? I think most people, when they start a business, they actually struggle generating enough revenue to keep the doors open. I mean, the expenses are us. Or a side effect of distribution. If you got distribution, you're going to have expenses. Correct. I think most people struggle to make that first dollar and make their first sale. And you and I were talking earlier, uh, you innovate a product, and let's say you make a dollar on a product. As a new startup, as a, as a new emerging entrepreneur, you know, what you need to do tomorrow, if you made a dollar today on a product, you need to go sell more of those products mm-hmm. tomorrow and make another dollar, another dollar, another dollar. Because that's what, that's what keeps the doors open. It keeps the dream going. Mm-hmm. And when you're starting, man, getting those small paychecks, Heck yeah. that, that keeps you fired up. Remember when I first started the hunting company, Fever Pursuit, um, I sold like a, I don't know what our first hunt was. You made a couple hundred bucks. We've been at this for months. <laughs> and we made a couple hundred bucks. Finally, hunt season's rolling around. We're getting some revenue in. And it was a... And then you went and spent twenty on a tour. Yeah, I was like, man, now I can go get, now I can go buy a new bow or something. Yeah. You know, I forgot that I was running a business, not a side job. But how did you go about getting distribution as a new company? That's not easy. Man, it's probably I, a lot harder today than it was then. Yeah, and and it is. And I've, I've told a lot of people that call me with with a one product idea. It is a lot tougher than when I I started. You know, back then, you know, the way of the world and the internet and email and all that stuff wasn't quite there yet. 
So you had to pick up the phone, go knock on the door, and get an appointment with these guys. And so that's what I did. You know, I flew to Sydney, Nebraska. I actually flew to Denver and drove to Sydney to see Cabela's and Mm -hmm. flew out to Springfield, Missouri, and saw Bass Pro. And, you know, me, myself, and I, and nobody representing us, just me and and my passion and my dream to uh, put the products on their shelves, you know. And we had some proven success in Academy and other customers that we had shown growth and, and potential so those guys gave us a chance you know and and that's what it boils down to is them allowing you to put it in there and give it a chance and then be successful and then once it's successful then they're they're looking to you to bring them some other items mm-hmm. and, and ideas and and so that's you know it's hard work it's it's flying out there and again overhead expenses travel expenses airline tickets those things weren't easy to pay for early yeah. on but you know it's uh it's evolved and now we have those distribution channels, so now we feed them the products that are that we know are successful. And uh, like I was telling you earlier, now you become a manager of the inventory and managing those how you flow it to those customers. And so it's that's one still bigger, not easy. That's one of your bigger challenges today. Than Correct. Managing the inventory. Correct. Deciding which products to push. And when you're an entrepreneur, you don't want to get rid of any products. That's your ideas. They're all your ideas. Yeah. You think they're the best, but you come to a realization that. We could put more money, inventory dollars into a certain product that's really successful and maybe slack off on the others. Still maybe provide them to those people that want to buy them, but you put you put more of your eggs in those bigger baskets that are doing well for you. And, and that's the challenge is, is sometimes letting go and, and leaving some of those products behind and uh, then welcoming the ones that are doing well for you. And some of the products I would have thought would have done better have not and some of the products i was like i don't know about that one have taken off Mm -hmm. so it's really up to consumer at the end of the day to what you're going to succeed with and not not what basically you want to drive down their down their throat you know they're going to tell you what they want at some point as business owners we have to move from what we call in our company entrepreneur to purposeful so you move from being an entrepreneur which is uh uh just that innovating hustling getting every scraping every dollar you can getting in front of as many people as you can you look up one day now you have distribution to deal with and you have uh employment to deal with and you have overhead costs to deal with and you start looking at consolidation and you have um all the challenges of owning a business and so then you we talked earlier about making key marketing decisions somebody has to make those as the organization grows you can no longer do everything and so yeah, at some point, entrepreneurs have to realize it's time for me to do one of two things, I think. Move from being that entrepreneur to now being a business owner and operator. Mm-hmm. Be more purposeful and intentional about all your activities. Everything you do, everything has to meet this standard or we can't afford to do it. Because it's tempting for us to try to do too many things. And it's like trying to advance the whole line at once. Yeah. It doesn't really work. In most most battles in the, in the Civil War, they progress the entire line across each other and it was the north versus they did the same thing in revolutionary war they get a line of people shooting guns and taking each other out back right? and forth well that's what you and i look like if we try to advance our entire organization chart at once by ourselves right you can't move it the battles are one when you break through the line at one point and you go take some territory and this unit breaks through the line mm-hmm. and they go have success and you build on that success and you break this one through over here one at a time and so with our products uh, and our services man that's fundamentally key i think and that's that's what we would call moving from entrepreneur to personal that's one thing we could do i think the other thing is you know i've been real clear with my staff and and even the companies that i work with or for that there's things i'm not good at you know and my mentor and coach gary keller gary got keller williams to a point where he realized he was no longer the CEO mm-hmm. to take the company to, to world dominant status, you know? And so he fired himself. He had the, he had the, the clarity to just fire himself as a CEO and hire somebody better. And then he did what he does well, which is coach and teach and train and innovate and hired somebody else to go grow the business and run the business. So I think that's a, that's a big realization you had. And I applaud you for that. Yeah. It, it takes, uh, it takes a lot of, uh, Realizing what you're good at and what you're not good at and and making sure that you have your employees know 
what their role is and what you expect of them. Yeah. And not, not make it too much. So, we, man, this is a changing industry. You look, you know, recently Cabela's acquired Bass Pro. You Actually were, opposite. Bass Pro I'm sorry. I'm yeah. sorry. I, I misspoke. You're right. Bass <laughs> Pro acquired Cabela's. And you look at uh, large holding companies, you know, Easton, Hoyt, um, so many of those brands are owned by the same companies. You look at uh, Dead Down Wind, uh, Trophy Taker, uh, uh, Ram Cat, Obsession Archery, all owned by a, a holding company. So we're seeing a lot of consolidation. Man, what are you seeing in your world, in, in the world of outdoor retail? How's that industry changing? It's a def, you know, there's definitely some challenges ahead. Um, brick and mortar stores are, are fighting the uh, online purchasing. And there's got to be a balance there, uh, yeah. a presence where there's a balance of offering the goods online and at a level where, you know, most hunt, hunters and fishermen like to go in and feel it, touch it, yeah. and buy it. But if they already know what they need, then they can click and get it to their house in a day or two. Uh, there we is got, some changes going on there. we got friends that do that. They'll go into a store like Cabela's, mm -hmm. and they will spend a couple hours in their preseason shopping around, seeing what they want. And they'll pull their they'll make their decisions, pull their Amazon app up, scan the barcode, see what they want to buy, and order it. Right. Cabela's actually delivered at that point. Cabela's delivered their value. That was having the product where you can touch and feel it, having the experts. And this isn't a plug for Cabela's. They're just right. a, having the experts there to help you make the decision. Only they didn't close the deal. They didn't close the deal. Yeah, and that's the difficult thing. And and they didn't even know it. Didn't even know it. You know. So the convenience. Uh, factor nowadays uh, for people to shop online is becoming a major play in this market, and and it's I think it's been there in other markets, mm -hmm. but it's it's becoming more real in our hunting and fishing mm -hmm. world as well. And so those, there's some challenges ahead for the industry and in, and in helping those that do have brick and mortar survive and become more creative with their online presence. How do we do that? Because um, I, I I do think that the brick and mortar is really important in our industry. Uh, but the brick and mortar stores, they've got to they've got to produce enough value for the consumer to continue coming back to them. Right. How do you see that happening? You know, I think it's uh, going to be a combination. I think that they're going to always specific, struggle in price in the price competition. They're going to struggle. Yeah. I think they're going to have to probably uh, react to the market by offering an in store discount program or some value to making the consumer come in some kind of a club membership correct. deal correct yeah if you keep coming and shopping with us you know you've got a membership here and you're going to you're going to see some discount for it or some free product or some Something. type of build up toward an incentive to where you don't go online and do it so it's going to be creative marketing is what it's going to be um we're seeing that in every change. industry real estate industry the hunting industry you look at real estate we see a lot of uh, a lot of agents and brokerages establishing a service or a club, some type of membership community feel, because mm -hmm. nobody wants to be sold to all the time, right? If I'm if I'm a right. and I actually happen to own a, a real estate company, but if I send you forty emails a year that are all about my listings and what I, what you can do for me, which is become a client, you're going to push unsubscribe. Or if you're my buddy, you may not push unsubscribe, but you're not going to read them. You delete. Yeah, you delete. <laughs> you delete and don't open. Yeah. Um, but if I'm giving you value somehow through the membership community, you'll open and be more likely to do business or refer business. Correct. Um, you look at uh, hunting companies like, uh, what's this big new one? Um, um, is it GoHunt.com? There's a couple of them that have popped up that are membership type of community feel. And uh, they're providing a lot of value, a lot of information. In turn, they're going to, they're going to, don't fool yourself. They're going to be sneaking in incremental fees or they're going to have a product to sell you at some point. And so that's kind of the direction that the, that the industry is going. I think that's a, I think it's a big thing we can do in, in retail, um, brick and mortar stores, be thinking that as a consumer, that's an angle I would see. Right. If they would be thinking membership, thinking community, thinking incentives for doing business with me. Because that's something they can offer that online can't, outside right. of the expertise. You know? Yeah, there's got to be some level of expertise there to offer, you know, such as a pro shop. Mm -hmm. Well, they're offering rigging out or you bet. getting it ready or tuning it up. There's some value there versus, uh, you know, some of the online stuff. Yeah, I think certain businesses like a, a bow shop, pro shop, you own one. We're going to go mm -hmm. see it in a little while here in Hallettsville. 
I, I would, me personally, as a hardcore bow hunter, very seldom do I shoot anything with a gun. Although I did buy a new one yesterday. <laughs> I bought a, I bought a uh, lever action thirty thirty to carry in my truck as the sidearm, you know. Um, keep my cowboy, <laughs> cowboy MO there. But I think it's industries like a gun store or a, a archery shop that probably are somewhat insulated from it, at least now. Right. Because it and takes... It will be. Yeah. I drive... i tell you how important I think it is. I drive two hours to the pro shop that I use to set yeah. my bow up because I'm not going to shoot it until the right guys touch it. Yeah, confidence. Yeah. For me, it's confidence. Exactly. And I think that's important, you know, um, for the brick and mortar to separate themselves from the rest of the field mm-hmm. by offering those type of services mm-hmm. and and becoming a, a, a wealth of knowledge and and value to the consumer to keep them coming back to the mm-hmm. door. Mm-hmm. If you don't, you're going to get left behind. Yeah. And Even and if you make the initial the sale, they won't reorder. Right. There's so many factors to that. I mean, it's one, it's the Amazon thing where they come in and shop at your store and then buy on Amazon. Mm-hmm. The second, I think the second scenario would be <clears throat> they buy the first one from you, but then when they reorder, they they reorder right. online. Well, and you have, to, you have to be competitive. I mean, yeah. there's no doubt. I mean... Um, but there is a factor of I need it and I need it now. Yeah. Uh, so you have to maintain in, in any business you have to maintain the margin, but you also have to be competitive with the marketplace yeah. Yeah. and make it to where it's not a big difference for them to go order and click and and get the product delivered. What do you think the effects of consolidation are? You've not sold out. No. You're independent. Correct. Okay. You're probably a uh, you're becoming the minority in that though. I'd say a company your size. I don't know. You know better than me. You can tell us, but. I would think you may be the minority in that a company your size that hasn't consolidated. I would think so. Uh, you know, there's several others, um, you know, especially regional companies. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of the rod building companies, those type, are still, you know, privately held. And there's something to say for that mm-hmm. uh, because, you know, when it goes to a big corporation. Like Waterloo customer, or something. Customer, yeah, Waterloo's still privately held. And some of those guys are and, and will remain that way because it's, it's more of a regional uh, product type following and and uh, they do a good job at what they do and so they're going to have their customer base mm-hmm. and it's going to continue that way you know we've had some people approach us in the past about possibly buying equity into our business and you know at this point or you know at that point it, it's just not the right time for us and i've got two uh crumb snatchers i need to think about as well so you know <laughs> you i don't get your president don't ceo sell, and training yeah us. that's right i, I don't want to sell it out and not have them have the opportunity to yeah. take it to a level I didn't, even, I didn't dream about, you know. Yeah. Um, That's the good thing about being an entrepreneur is you get to at least offer them that. Correct. You get to see if, boys, is this something you you want for your life? And they're going to have to work at it to earn it. But sure. <clears throat> it's definitely something that I, I want to leave on the table. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> How do you stay different? I mean, there's, there's other people that do similar things to what you do. Um how do you stay different? What is the value proposition of? I think the reality of it is, is we, we live hunting and fishing. We go do it. So we real we understand what that guy or that gal is looking for, and so I think that's how we stay a little different. Connect than, that to a product to one of your um, one of your sixty products. And okay, so our waiting net, you know, we we developed a waiting net that floats, uh, it mm-hmm. doesn't drag and doesn't pull grass behind you. It's an awesome net. Get stuck, way. and it's been a great success. And it was just from using them and being out there and and coming up with a concept that works and it's simple and and you know keep it simple. Stupid was a, a rule of of law and economics class, and so you know that's kind of what we do with all of our products. We don't make them too too glitzy and 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 glamorous but we make them practical yeah and we keep them affordable and so you know i think when somebody picks up one of our products and buys it they feel like they've got a good value in the product thought is it going to last forever it's not a meat none of your stuff is me too no it's not a me too unique. product yeah they're unique yeah. Uh, we've really never just carbon copied anybody's product per se we may have changed some things and improved upon mm-hmm. an idea that was out there but i don't think anybody can say oh man that looks exactly like a Yeti cup. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and yeah. we've seen that here lately. We've but, seen that. You know, mean. we've, and, and hey, hats off. Those guys are killing it. You know, they've, they've taken yeah, they've a market and changed job. it. And Incredible so, job. um, so we've, you know, we've made some things and, and they're unique and in their own right and been able to survive, you know, because of that. And so, you know, we, that's what we want to continue to bring to the market is, is unique items that, um, keep the consumer in mind that they work 
first of all, they provide a value, and that they're affordable. You know, so and that's kind of where we've, we've... Is that coming been. from from you using the stuff or from your guides and outfitters, pro staff that you work with? We, we take feedback from them all the time. You know, if, if they see something that's wrong, you know, we it's hard to adjust midstream mm-hmm. in a product. So it takes some time. And that's yeah. sometimes, I think, what the consumers don't realize. If we don't, if we have a little glitch or flaw in something, it takes us time to get to the next phase or the generation two yeah. to improve it. And, yeah, and, and a year you in learn some from cases. From yeah, and a year in some cases. Because you gotta, you've got to sell what you have and then revamp the product and, and come out with a new. And, and so it takes some time. But we're always changing and looking to improve and make it better than it was before. Mm-hmm. So when you take, if I say, hey, Billy, or you, you're sitting around deer camp and we say, damn, somebody ought to do this with their feeder. Just so happens you're that somebody. Yeah. Do you do you just go benchmark it then and try and see who else may be doing something similar? Or do you run out and create a prototype and then run a pro form on it? How do you do That's that? That's what we do. I mean, we typically create the prototype, test it, use it, and then see if it's something we want to pursue. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have to go to the to the to the retail channels and see if there's something they're interested in carrying, or is that risk on you first? To create and build first. inventory and then go to them and say, it's I've got first. 10,000 feeders I'd love for you to sell. Yeah, sometimes they bring us ideas and yeah. then we'll try to create it for them. Uh, but typically it's on us you know, to innovate, bring the product to light, and then take it to them and say, look, this is our idea. And we believe in it 100%. Will you walk it with us? You know, Will, mm-hmm. you, will you try it with us? And mm-hmm. So uh, that's kind of how, how it starts. And it, those times have changed from when I first started to now because there's a lot of pressure on these buyers and and the you know the economics of it is not as good as it was 10 years ago it's not as talking about buyers you're talking about the buyers like the, the academy buyer correct. or the Cabela's buyer correct yeah. the, the merchandise yeah. guys and you know they, they're they're more conservative than they used to be and, and rightfully so we're in a more difficult market place than we were 10 years ago um, so in order for them to take that risk and chance it has to be something they wholeheartedly believe in, mm-hmm. or sometimes we test it in certain stores and see how it goes, and then then roll out from there. And so, you know, it, it it's uh, it's got to prove itself. The product's mm-hmm. got to prove itself, and then from there it takes off. What about marketing? Getting your <coughs> products in front of consumers that's changed a lot, also. Yeah, it has. It's mm-hmm. changed from a lot of print media and and uh, more social things. media driven. <clears throat> nowadays and internet and websites and things like that um, but I've always said product on the shelf is your best advertisement product on the shelf in the hands of the guys and consumers sense. that's your best advertisement because uh, you really can't tell from a magazine ad how many people looked at it and yeah. actually triggered to go buy it you yeah. know uh, some of that does work but you know it's hard to gauge yeah so you have to be in certain areas um, product on the shelf yeah I've see you're now now i have to make a decision and if you believe in your product and the packaging and uh the quality then you believe it's going to outperform the others correct yeah and that's you know separating yourself with good packaging and and a story behind it or you know people seeing us using the product or the guides using the product or pro staff using the product that sells it Mm -hmm. you know that 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 to the consumer is enough Mm -hmm. and that's when they go buy it Mm mm-hmm you know, and some of them pick it up in the store and go, man, this is a great idea. i got to try it, you know. <laughs> and just like the net, you know, it, yeah. I would have never imagined that it would take off like it did. But it's, Do you it's get great. feedback on that from consumers also? Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, at trade shows and things like that, we still do. They'll come up to us and say, man, wait, i got the net. I love that thing. Or I've got your boots, and we love them. And, you know, the, the net won the ICAST Innovative Product Award in, in 2013. Did it really? Yeah. That's and awesome. So that Congratulations. Helped, you know, that helped that. and. We hadn't been ICAST since. <laughs> the overhead of doing those shows is, is really high. It's pretty so, high. So we backed off of some of that. We did a show, a trophy hunter show. The last one I did, I, mean, I think it was in Dallas. Um, man, it cost us five or 6000 to do that show. Yeah, By they're the not time you got your floor space and yeah. your booth design and had some inventory and, a, you know, <clears throat> tried to create a couple of um, mouse traps to get people to actually give you their information. Right. It, it was five or six thousand in Heck a yeah. week. Out it's of a lot. It's a lot it. of money to go to those shows. You know, travel expenses, hotels, meals, all that stuff. So we pick and choose where we go and try to try to spread them out different 
different every year, so we get feedback from different consumers. Yeah. And that's really what it is. You're interacting with consumers at those shows. It's important, man. A lot of people <clears throat> get into the industry, and they're looking for the... They don't have a whole lot of money to spend. Right. When you first launch a company, most people don't, unless unless you have uh, investors or, or outside equity or you're just inherently wealthy. Mm-hmm. You don't have a lot of money to spend. Right. So you're going to make it out of sweat equity, uh, which you've done a you know, tremendous job of, and, and we fully understand that, too. Um, but people look for that magic thing. If I have a, a ad in this magazine or if I do this show or if I get this promotional partner, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to accelerate and go from zero to 100 overnight. It, I, don't, I haven't seen that be the case. A good banker is your best friend because uh, just like with this business, you know, I started out with not any wealth mm-hmm. or <laughs> equity in myself <laughs> and had to go borrow the money and, and bring in the inventory and then hope like heck it's old. And, yeah. And uh, so, you know, once you build equity into it, it makes it a little easier. Yeah. But you're always still, especially in our situation, we're always using our bank, and 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 he's our, you know, he he's our watchdog too. He kind of keeps track of what we're doing, and and it's important for a entrepreneur to know that. To you can't fund it all, and you can't expect to fund it all. You're gonna have to use financing to do it, and and to make it work. Hey guys, let's talk real estate for a second. Buying or selling a piece of land may be the largest financial transaction you'll ever make. Gary Keller once said, There are two kinds of real estate agents, those who list property and those who market property. At Mock Ranches, we are ranch marketing experts. So choose a real estate firm that specializes in land sales and understands land management. Learn more at MockRanches.com and receive a free ranch map when you mention the Bucks to Business podcast. That's MockRanches.com. Our featured ranch listing this week is the Bernie Hill Ranch in Kendall County, Texas. Bernie Hill Ranch is 504 scenic acres, located one mile from the Starbucks of all things, at Interstate 10 in Bernie, Texas. This is the largest ranch currently available in the Bernie area, making it an attractive investment. The ranch's namesake, Bernie Hill, is the highest point in Kendall County at 1,846 feet above sea level and offers unrivaled views of the Texas Hill Country. Bernie Hill Ranch is listed exclusively by Mock Ranches, being offered at $8.5 million. For information on all of our ranch listings, visit MockRanches.com. So what's the one thing you would tell others uh, that are interested in getting in the outdoor industry? I think a lot of people are attracted to what we do. They see it as a sexy business and they like to hunt and fish. You know, why wouldn't you want to make your living in this? Looks sure. like Billy and Casey have fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would just say it's like you know, song if so it's much- something you truly believe in yeah. and you have faith in, then by all means try it. But bounce ideas off of people like me and Casey because we've been there, done that, and we can probably – help you uh, make some of those decisions before you actually make them yourself. And and there's a ton of people like us out there that own mm-hmm. businesses. And I told this to the class at A&M, you're crazy if you don't go ask questions. Mm-hmm. Everybody grew up somewhere where they know business owners. And I guarantee you the door's wide open to go ask those questions because it's free advice, you know. And so um, that would be one of the things I would think would be one of the best attributes is to go ask a bunch of questions of your local bankers before you get into business uh, business owners themselves that have started from scratch or in a similar business that you're looking to go into yeah uh, poll those people and that's ask great the advice. questions you know and that's free advice it, it doesn't cost you a darn thing maybe a lunch mm-hmm. but that's a whole lot cheaper than losing a bunch of money on something you didn't you didn't mm-hmm. ask a question about we mastermind a lot <clears throat> uh with top agents, with other business professionals, we have a lot of masterminds. Whether I set, if I think I need one, I'll set it up, mm-hmm. and if I've invited you to some, right, um, and then I get invited to others, and you learn so much <clears throat> from people that have been down that road yeah. before you, or maybe they're they're parallel with you now. They're on the same level. They're right. going through the same process today, and uh, and and you can compare ideas. And I just I'm vulnerable in those situations. I don't I don't worry about somebody knocking me off. You're yeah. probably not going to go mastermind with your direct competitor, <laughs> no. but um, I'm, I try to be vulnerable in those situations as much as I can anyway, not worry about somebody knocking me off, but really ask those questions. I sit on several committees, and uh, I've learned stuff like logo designs and color schemes that I never thought of. I thought we had a cool logo. We designed it, put it out, and about the time we're going to go to market with it, 
I was on a committee with the Realtors Lane Institute, and they were discussing new logo designs, and so people brought up some very valid points. I was like, "Ooh, I'm about to make that. I'm about to make that mistake in my own business." And so you do learn a lot from other people. Yeah, you do. Yeah, I mean that, that's that's where your knowledge and history of success comes from is from entrepreneurs that have made it. Yeah, through over the hump, and I would tell those that are looking to get into it, don't expect to see it really take off for a couple of years. I mean, it takes time to to overcome mm-hmm. those initial expenses mm-hmm. and things. And so you're going to have to be patient. And if you're not willing to do that, then it's probably not for you. Mm-hmm. Um, because to for, for an entrepreneur to make a living on something in the first year would be a pretty hard stretch. Pretty hard stretch. Yeah. 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 Give me your cornerstone products on the hunting and fishing side. You've got two sides of the company. And I think we'll record some future episodes where you come in and Maybe this this spring we'll come in and talk about some fishing products that y'all are excited about. Right. But uh, give me your cornerstone products on either side of the business. On the hunting side, really our snake protection line of products is a really big big market for us. Something um, nobody else does, really. No, we, we've kind of mastered that market in a way. And, uh, you know, we've become um, the go-to for a lot of retailers. If you if you go look us up, look up snake protection online, you're going to find us in so that's that's been a cornerstone in the, in the hunting industry. Of course, our our field care, our hitch hoist, and and that kind of stuff. But there's a narrow window of opportunity with those items, yeah. tailgate feeders and deer feeders and things like that. Of course, that's a narrow opportunity mm-hmm. in the fall, and you know, so it's they're big, but they're not as big as the snake protection because that's mm-hmm. year round. Mm-hmm. On the fishing side, you know, our wade fishing gear is is top notch, and you know, everything from wading belts to the net we mentioned earlier to our pliers and and so on and so forth. It's just a well-rounded line. And I, I was always taught, you know, diversify in whatever you do in your investments. And that's how I've approached this business is diversification of product selection and its workforce. And, and I'm, you know, feel very fortunate to have that advice early on mm-hmm. and to know to look to that because there's times when the hunting side struggles or there's times when the fishing side struggles and the other lifts the other up. So yeah. it, it really has rounded out our product selection and you know some of these guys are just fall, and I don't know how they do it. You know and that hunting industry has been tough this year in Texas, especially with the oil yeah. and gas market being in the tank. That's it was a tough year for a lot it's of been people. Been a challenge in that for industry. a lot of, of my friends and and you know people in the industry. And you know we've we've talked about it, and you know I think they're prepared to see a better light next year with things mm-hmm. that have happened and transpired, and and we're hopeful you know that it turns around and and it's it's. When good managers manage their business properly, you'll see the doors continue mm-hmm. to be open and the lights continue to turn on. But in years like this is when you find out how good you are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's where the grit pays off. A lot of people, I think you're unique because you're you're the only salesman for Foreverlast. Is that right? right? Yeah, I have yeah. some, you know, Chris Leonard is a good friend of mine. He yeah. helps me and gives me advice. And yeah. He is a, Chris He is helps a, me at Academy. An, an and, and incredible man. Things. And he's an incredible friend and, yeah. and like a brother to me. And and um, so he helps me. Uh, doesn't expect anything in return, but, of course, I always try to help him out. And, and so <clears throat> it's been, uh, you know, it's been me. And, and I kind of like it that way because it, it yeah. it, that's what I like to do. When things get lean, though, nobody cares about your business like you do. No. Nobody's going to go sell as hard as you are. All right. And um, that's I think that's missing in our industry. I think it's missing. Um, where can people find your products? Where can we buy Forever Last stuff? Most retailers on a fishing side are you know located along the Texas Gulf Coast and <clears throat> and on around even Florida. Um, online at foreverlast.com. Uh, we're on Facebook at Forever Last Inc. Okay, you got an online store at foreverlast.com. <clears throat> Correct, and okay. you can go on there and, and shop there, or you can uh, visit any of our retailers: Academy, Bass Pro, Cabela's. <clears throat> carry an assortment of our products they may not have them all but mm-hmm. you can find all of them on our website okay okay <clears throat> how can i help you brother man you've you've uh you've helped me today by putting this together and bouncing ideas and hopefully i can help it. you down the road yeah we'll do business man i appreciate you billy um i've i've been inspired by your story i've been inspired by watching your company grow uh and i guess i got in i guess i, I first started using your products around 2007 when you yeah. made that move to go full time, yeah. that's when we were tournament fishing really hard, <clears throat> right. and um, so I've seen the company grow. And it's it's even before I knew you, it was inspiring to watch it. You can tell it's driven out of a passion for the industry, driven by a great entrepreneur, 
and I've gotten to know you and, and uh, learn what drives you. Your passion for God and family uh, is inspiring. So, well, thank you, man. I'm proud to call you a friend. Yeah, likewise. I, I appreciate what you're doing and, and your drive and your entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, I, I recognize that the first time we met. And um, I remember when we hunt, went hunting out there with Bodie. Yeah, Bodie said, we get you know, Bodie Langford on this he podcast said that, too. Uh, he said that old Casey, he's going to be in politics one day. <laughs> no, he's too dirty. dirty for me. It's too dirty for me. I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> All right, buddy. We thanks. appreciate it, man. Thanks you for coming bet. out. Talk to you soon. Yes, sir. If you enjoyed this podcast, please follow us on iTunes and give us a review. We enjoy reading your reviews, and the ratings help us move up the list. You can also follow us on social media at Instagram or Facebook at Bucks to Business Podcast.